I, I, I... I'm so sorry, Phyllis, well. I didn't hear. I'm sorry, Phyllis, can you repeat what you just said? I said I didn't get a chance to read the short story. doesn't matter, Phyllis. There's so much here that relates to modern pandemic, American global Jewish <laughs> culture that uh, we can spend hours on this. This was such a fascinating experience for me to prepare because as Rabbi Moshe knows, I spent hours and hours looking for a short story that was really short and pithy. Because I believe if we get to the pith, like Phyllis said, find the people that you know are interested and keep reminding them. So what what this writer, her name is Leslie Marmon Silko. Uh, she is a writer extraordinary, uh, and, and we'll see why. Uh, she was born in, uh, in 1948, and she grew up on the edge of a Pueblo, Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. Being on the edge of it, she had mixed parentage, parentage is Hispanic, Mexican, Hispanic, uh, and also Anglo. So she's a mixture of cultures. And so this ties in very much to a story that is that brings together uh, traditional Catholic Spanish culture, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Catholic culture, if you will, although that's a, uh, a paradox, Anglo-Saxon, more Protestant, but what I'm talking about uh, uh, is white Catholic culture. And of course, we're going to be superimposing the, the Judaic culture, our traditions, on two other traditions that built from our tradition. That's what makes the, this such an exciting adventure for all of us, okay? All right, so Leslie Marmon Soko, a writer, she's a poet, she's a novelist, an essayist, and one of the top, she's anth anthologized this story, The Man to Send Rain Clouds is perhaps the most anthologized Native American short story in textbooks today, okay? All right, so a summary, a brief summary. What's, yeah, what's the name of the short story? The name of the short story is The Man to Send Rain Clouds. Oh, that, sounds like, that sounds like a Gemara in Tanis. It, uh, it, uh, there's a lot here. There's a lot related to Tanis and the rituals that we go through in order to uh, beseech the Great One to open up the heavens. And, uh, and we'll see how the Native American culture has dealt with this uh, problem uh, of drought along with the Catholic culture uh, in uh, contrast. Uh, welcome, you know, there's uh, a lot here. I just uh, welcome Gloria who joined us. Good to see you, Gloria. And um, so for everyone's benefit, Richard, you could continue. I'll just uh, put a link to the yeah. story in the chat. So if anyone wants to sure. reference the text, uh, they can do that. So I'll do that momentarily. Yeah. Gloria, welcome. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Happy Rosh Kodesh. Air of uh, Shabbos. It's a pleasure that you're able to join us. And... Um, this is our second session as we celebrate a beautiful uh, self who brings to the table. I've had so many years of experience across the United States, including Native American culture, which I'll um, later on get into if we have time. I don't want to get into that because I, I relate to the uh, Native American culture because I live and spent owned by Native Americans. Uh, back in the, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it was, of course, they were displaced, they were murdered, they were cruelly tortured, and the white man took over uh, uh, the, their land. So land is very important in all these stories that, uh, this particular story, very important. Okay, so we're talking about a summary. So you have an old man, his name is Teofilo, T-E-O-F-I-L-O, -E and we'll get into that because it's symbolic meaning to that name, okay? Uh, I'll mention very briefly now, uh, T.O. means from the word like theology. It has to do with divine, with God. And Philo means son. So here's an old man, his name is the son of God. And of course, you, you know, that refers to Yeshu, okay? Uh, okay, so, but he's living, he is a Native American grandfather. He has died peacefully while tending sheep out at the sheep camp away from the village. Leon and Ken, which we'll talk about, find him under a cottonwood tree. Again, that's a, a symbol right there, the cottonwood tree. We'll, we'll get to that. Every, it's a very 
short, short story full of so much symbolism. Okay. But because his sheep have wandered away, the two brothers-in-law first collect them, the sheep, and put them in the corral. Then they prepare Teofilo for burial. So obviously a man has died by painting his face, tying a gray feather in his hair. Relate this to uh, our Hebra Kadisha, you know, the Tahara that we do, and wrapping him in a red blanket. So they, and then they also pour pollen and, and corn into the wind above his body. Okay. On the way back in the truck, they meet Father Paul. He's a, he's a Catholic priest who asks about Teofilo. Leon turns the question aside. They don't want to answer, answer him. Okay, avoiding the imposition of a Roman Catholic funeral. So there you have the second culture. You have Native American culture. Now, that, now you have the Catholic uh, uh, white man's culture. After the medicine men have performed the traditional funeral, Louise, Teofilo's granddaughter and Ken's wife, tells Leon that she thinks the priest should sprinkle holy water so that the te Teofilo will not be thirsty. Okay, again, that's part of the uh, Native American uh, theology that the body should be transported uh, in, in, with, uh, full of water, should not be thirsty. And that's also symbolic of the drought, as we'll see later on. That relates to the, uh, uh, the ritual of overcoming uh, in Thomas, like Phyllis says, the drought. Okay? Um, Leon invites Father Paul to bring his holy water to the grave. In spite of the irregularity, Father Paul tells Leon that last rites in the Mass should be said before a proper Catholic burial. Okay, so the Catholics have their own way of burying. They have sacraments that need to be performed. There are rituals. There are sprinkling of water on the body, and there are uh, benedictions in Latin that must be performed. And the Father, says, hey, I want to be involved. You had your, you did it your way. Don't get my culture involved. Okay. In spite of the regularity, okay, um, he, Leon, I'm sorry, Father Paul tells Leon the last rites and the mass should be said before a proper burial. He accepts the invitation to, to be part of the ceremony and sprinkles the water. So he does give in. He cannot understand how, how and why the water disappears almost before it hits the sand. So we're, it's, it, it, the funeral is taking place, I believe, could be uh, late April, I'm sorry, late February, beginning of March. It's still very cold. Uh, there's snow in the mountains, as, as the story described. Okay, so it, this prompts a moment of crisis and climax in the story as the puzzled priest returns to the mission unaware of his own effectiveness in the ceremony. Okay, so you have principal characters. Theophilo, the old shepherder who has passed away and is going through a proper Native American and with a little overlay of uh, Catholic burial rites. You have Louise, the granddaughter. She only talks to Ken, her husband. Okay, she, uh, she's the one that urges Ken, look, before you bury him our way, please ask Father to sprinkle some water. It's only right because we're burying him in a, the Catholic cemetery. And of course, that raises another issue. Where, where's the Native American cemetery? So their culture, we can assume has been absorbed by the Catholic culture and they no longer have their own proper burial grounds, but that's another issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, I so a question. We, yeah, yes, go ahead. So just to clarify, so are the Native Americans under the control of the Christians right now? Meaning are they even allowed to practice their own religion? They, yes, at this point, what uh, Leslie Soko is implying is that they have, they're able to practice their own Native American traditions, but yet at the same time, some of them have been baptized in the church. Okay, again, that's a water sprinkling ceremony, uh, and some have not. So it's a question in his mind is, should I, I, maybe these people have not been properly baptized. Although they do, many of them go to the Catholic Church, they part participate in the rites, the Catholic rites, and they use the burial ground. And many of them are complete Catholics, and some of them are like Moranos. They're, they're, they're practicing their own rites at home, and they're going along with the Christian rites of the church. So there's, um, that's a good question. Um, 
the uh, uh, and that's that's one of the issues here is how far do you go in letting people practice your religion when you know that they have not they're not completely apart and have, and and how do they achieve afterlife and we can compare that with our our tradition in in the Native American tradition you have a, there's certain rites that you need to go through in order to be united with the great spirit okay that's their way of calling Hashem they call him the great spirit okay he's the great spirit of the mountains the great spirit of nature he has many different uh, 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 shall we say tzvaot are our emanations uh, uh, many different gods of agriculture there are many different gods of corn and as I researched there, there's no end to the amount of, of, of um, theology in uh, Native American lore but there is one great American spirit there is a unity and in order to be joined with the unity, you have to perform certain rites, okay? So that leads me into the first um, uh, major issue which you can talk about is the burial rites. This is a major issue here, okay? It begins with a red blanket. The old man is wrapped in a red blanket. Now this, in Native American law, symbolizes your guarding against evil forces, again, it's a very simple burial. That's why this Sark story is so so crisp and clear, is that the Indian rites of burial compared to our rites and the Christian rites, very simple. So you wrap them in a red blanket. Uh, you may leave your shoes on. I think in the story to be further, you can see his shoes as he's being buried. Uh, you then um, uh, tie a feather to his, uh, he had long, white hair and they tie the feather. The feather symbolizes the journey. Uh, of course, the eagle represents um, a, a, a one of the gods of Native American culture. The great many of the Indian chiefs are great named with the name eagle. And so the eagle feather, the feather symbolizes that the body, the spirit will have a safe journey to the great spirit. It will be united with the with Hashem. Their, their version of Hashem. Okay. Then they paint the face. The paint is, the face is painted with white paint and blue paint. Okay. Again, this is a form of uh, a blessing. Blessings are done at this time, and that is to invoke protection of the body, uh, the spirit, which is now leaving the body and going to heaven. And then you have the cornmeal and pollen which is sprinkled over the body, and that is to ward off evil forces as the spirit, as the man is, is, travels through the spiritual world. So that is their simple version of, and what I wanna to mention to you is that it's a natural process. There isn't anything with having to, you know, uh, to beg forgiveness, to do vidui, as we have it, and Rabbi Moshe may want to talk about. Uh, there's nothing Christian uh, to, to merit salvation. You have to do penitence. You've got to go through sacramental rites in the Catholic Church. Uh, in, in the Christian burial, it's very simple. The body is simply, you sprinkle a little water on the body, uh, you prepare the body with a feather, uh, you paint the face, uh, and then you have a very simple burial, uh, in the, as we'll see in the Christian uh, churchyard in this particular case. Um, all right, so that- Richard, Richard yeah, that, excuse me, you mentioned yeah, ahead, something yeah. about sprinkling, sprinkling the body yes. with, or the face with a corn something? What yeah, that we, what they do is they sprinkle. They sprinkle corn and pollen seeds. on top of the white and blue. On, on top of the on top of the uh, after the body is covered in the red blanket, uh, they just sprinkle it. Okay, and it goes to the wind. Okay, uh, some of it resides on the body, but it's you know it's a symbol. It's symbolic of uh, of uh, uh, fertility. We do pollen something is, of course, similar. Like, you know, yeah. We do something. We uh, do something similar, but we don't have the same reason for doing it. What are you thinking? Yes. Of? Uh, uh, yeah. We use the afar from uh, from from Israel. Right. We put uh -huh. on the well, you also, but, you also but right. the connection. Right. You're thinking of a tahara. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh -huh. many people aren't aren't privy to that. So Phyllis, you're on, you're on mm -hmm. Chaver Kadisha, right? Yes. 
So maybe you want to uh, you want to share with us your experience in Hever Kadisha, how you're using that Uffer, how you're using the um, the earth in well, the process. Well, it, it's you know it's it's connection it's a, our connection to Yerushalayim, mm -hmm. and and since we can't be buried in Israel, so we you know that's it's kind of like a makeshift. Moran. We, we yeah. use the dirt from Israel uh, to put on on certain in certain areas on the body. Um, you know, instead. But but there's also what we do is always you know connection to to Hashem. You know, we we have no uh, we have no um, you know gods and whatever. Um, well, I, I, I like the emanation. No we, we have emanations. Uh, we talk oh. about Tzvaot. Uh, God has his, his malachim messengers. And That's, I think in the uh, Indian lore. But, but Rabbi still. Moshe? Oh, also. Oh, not Richard, the same thing, I realize. Oh, so it's not the same right. thing. Right. <laughs> so I think you're right that um, what Phyllis and you were saying is correct that in Judaism, there's a, there's a whole debate among the philosophers. Um, the more rationalist philosophers, they didn't like the idea of the mazolos of the different emanations of God, because they thought that came a little too close to polytheism. Mm -hmm. Whereas those who, uh, I think you're referring to Richard, those who are of a more um, philosophical, mystical bent, the philosophers of a more mystical bent, they said, look, these emanations are okay. It's fine that there's multiple emanations. They're emissaries of God. Uh, yeah. So the question is, you know, are they similar to God? Because that, according to Rambam, uh, when he said, he asked the question, how did idolatry ever start? Because, okay, Adam and Eve, they knew there was God. Uh, their children knew there was God. So at what point along the way did people suddenly start worshiping a Bodhisattva? Wouldn't every ensuing generation know that there was God? So what just happened was that people said, well, they, well, they believe that the stars in the heaven, that they were partners or they were servants of God. And then eventually they said, well, look, you know, if God puts them up in the heavens and gives them kavod, gives them honor, we should honor them as well. And eventually the emanations, the mazalos, they became equal level to God. And eventually they displaced God altogether in the pagan idea and pagan uh, theology. So it's, um, you know, Phyllis, Richard, you're both right. It's, uh, it's a subject of debate as to do these mazalos and emanation, are they accepted within Jewish philosophy? That's a huge debate. But uh, anyway, that's a bit of a tangent, I know. But not at the time of burial. What was that? Not at the time of burial for us. Right. That's that's why I was a little confused at first. And I realized that you do Hever Kadisha work. The sprinkling is done before the burial. That's right. Yeah, the, um, the, the corn also represents, uh, as we know, as part of fertility, pollen is, of course, Fertile fertility, it's equivalent of the sperm, pollen in a sense, the anther, the pollen. Um, the, uh, so the corn, back to Phyllis's point, the, I find that beautiful, mystical, beautiful corn and pollen being thrown over the body at the time of the, the spirit is very close. And they're trying to make that the elevation a very smooth one, okay? And at the same time, every believe every Native American burial done according to the Native American way and not the Christian way is, is simplifying the progress, the, uh, the journey of the soul uh, to uh, the Great Spirit. Uh, and at the same time, asking a, a symbol for a blessing for rain. Okay, because th this is very important. The, the very first words that are uttered in the story have to do, one of the uh, grandchildren says now that he's gone, uh, to quote, send us rain clouds, grandfather. They laid the bundle, that, that's the red blanket with Theophilo in, in the back of the pickup. So that's the very first thing that they say, that each, each passing of life brings man back to nature and man's spirit connects to the great Lord above, and and we hope that that journey is a quick, quick and smooth one, so that 
the, the Great Spirit will listen to our, our requests and grant us rain, okay? And, uh, and the short story ends uh, very significantly with these words. Now the old man can send them big thunder clouds for sure, okay? So that is the way it ends. So uh, this is a story of, 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 of a right that is very important. And what I find beautiful is they combine a simple burial with the, with the request, like Phyllis Tanis, there is a drought and there are always droughts. When I lived in California, I lived through eight years of drought and, and that drought was devastated the area I lived in. I bought a home for nothing, a beautiful home up in the mountains. And now 30 years later, that entire community has been wiped out because of a lack of rain. The whole community of Paradise, California, 40,000 uh, people had to evacuate, 17,000 homes, including the one that I had sold prior, completely destroyed because of a drought and because of man's not, lack of respect for the land, okay? And what Phyllis says is very significant about bringing the afar of Yisrael to us is that we know that it's a holy land. And so the soil, the Jerusalem brick, I have a, behind me, perhaps you can see, I have a menorah that is made from Jerusalem stone, okay? Uh, so we revere uh, the land of, we say, Berkat Mazon, we revere, revere the land, the second prayer, uh, Al Hadama. So um, the, the land is very important. And, and in this story, what I find sad is that the, at this point, the Native Americans no longer have their own burial grounds, but they have been subsumed uh, into the white man's culture. And, um, and that's, of course, Rabbi wants to talk about the Hellenistic culture that we were at this time, uh, 2000 years ago, we were subjected to and, and we successfully overcome. And, and the Native Americans today are still fighting for their own land. They're in reservations, they've been persecuted. Millions of Native Americans have lost their lives as a result of our manifest destiny, if you will. I mean, it's part of American history. It's a sad part. Just like we have lost millions of our people on the Holocaust through the ages, you know, going back, you know, to the um, 24,000, Baal PR, 24,000 that were Magefa at that time, right up to these times. Um, there's no end to the, um, uh, the clash of cultures and the fact that one culture places itself above another culture. Um, any comments? I, don't, I could keep on going here because I have other themes to talk about, but I want to stop here and see if Rabbi wants to mention something about Hellenism uh, at, at, versus the way that the Charles III was the king. Uh, there's a symbol here that is very important. They speak about the two uh, church bells on this Christian Catholic church that were donated by the King's Bells. And I did research on that. And evidently the very first mission in California was the mission San Diego, uh, established by Father Junipero Serra, who's under a lot of, <laughs> he's under a lot of heat now with this, uh, you know, uh, hashtag Native American group because he, persecuted a lot of and, and destroyed a lot of the Native American culture as he established uh, missions. So the very first mission, San Diego, uh, was presented with two bells from Charles III, who was um, uh, king of Spain back in 1777. And um, so when that mission was dedicated, uh, he gave two bells. So that's, that indicates the heavy influence of Spanish, Hispanic culture, dominating, in a sense, assimilating. If they couldn't assimilate, they actually persecuted and killed hundreds and hundreds of Native Americans in the missions, through the missions. There were something like 24 missions in California. I visited mission uh, in, in San Francisco, mission in San Jose. It's a mission in Carmel mission, celebrating 250 years this year. So the mission is a very mixed bag of blessing for the Catholic Church, and it's a very mixed blessing for Native Americans. But 
Uh, the problem of being dominated by another culture, and 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 Leslie Soko Marmon, Leslie Marmon Soko is very much a Native American protagonist. She is fighting to keep her, even though she was born into an English-speaking family uh, and cannot speak her native Pueblo, Laguna Pueblo tongue, she is trying to show how important our traditions are and they must remain important and we must adhere to our traditions, very much like we as Jews, we must adhere to our tradition and keep the spirit of Hanukkah alive and you know, remember that at one time we were Hellenized uh, our, our our synagogues were taken over. We were not allowed to circumcise, allowed to keep kosher, keep Shabbat, you know, and we had to go to their their mikvah and go to the the Greek baths and partake in, in Christian ceremonies and they and introduced uh, idols into our Beit Hamikdashim. Uh, we've been through this, you know, and and uh, it's a never-ending uh, uh, battle for our culture. To remain intact and remain well whole. No, oh, that's uh, that's well said. And I, you know, Richard, I really appreciate how you chose to do this story during Hanukkah, because, like you just eloquently explained, uh, the connection couldn't be clearer. That here in the story, there's this uh, struggle, this tension between the Native American religions and culture versus the, I guess what you call the imported religion and culture of Catholicism of Christianity. And when you look at the holiday of Hanukkah, ostensibly we are praising God, we are celebrating that here, here an outside uh, religion, outside culture came and dominated us. We stood up for ourselves and we defended our way of life. So, and I, I think that's definitely the way that you're going down, but what I want to do is maybe challenge us and complicate the, uh, sure. the analogy a little. Sure. So I think it's challenging because if one wants to read the story of Hanukkah as um, one culture or religion should not impose itself on another, well, we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, in the story of Hanukkah, we're the underdogs, so it's easy to yep. root for us. But what about if we go back to biblical times where the Jewish people, the Israelites, were commanded by God to conquer the land of Israel mm -hmm. and actually to destroy and get rid of any Avodah Zarah, any idolatry that could be found in the land. So, yes. you know, while in the story of Hanukkah, we're the underdogs overcoming the outsiders. If you go back before we got the land of Israel, we were the outsiders going in there. Um, it's amazing how uh, it, 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 it flips around so quickly. And maybe that's the reason why we have suffered so much is because we have, in a sense, we got rid of a, a whole tribe called Shechem, got rid of all the males, we decimated them <laughs> uh, you know, wholeheartedly, third day of circumcision. Um, we have done some very cruel uh, acts uh, as part of our culture. And, and we've suffered. Uh, we have suffered. Um, uh, Hispanic culture has suffered. I mean, I'm thinking uh, originally uh, Spanish culture was in search of El Dorado. You know, they were in search of gold. So uh, the, uh, uh, the medieval Spanish kings sent over Cortez, as you know, Cortez uh, and Pizarro, and they conquered uh, Spanish uh, 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 South America, the Incas, the Peru, uh, Colombia, uh, Mexico, always in search of gold. And so that was, an, and so uh, other cultures uh, were unimportant in their uh, uh, conquering uh, the Aztecs, for instance. I mean, it was just pure uh, uh, native force against native force. There was no religion trying to impose Christianity. Originally, Spanish conquest was for gold. And then it morphed. It morphed under the time of Charles III, as I mentioned in the 1750s, that to bring the white man's burden is to bring our culture. We have, we're, we're the civilized world. They're, they're the natives, they're the savages. Now who's to say, they're the, they have beautiful customs, but yet we, I'm talking about we, the, the white man, 
manifest destiny white man. We have brought our culture in because we're we're a superior culture. Are we really superior? That's that's what you're raising, Rabbi Moshe. It's a great point. Are we superior because we have a divinity, uh, an Hashem that says, "Go ahead and conquer them." Well, they can have their own divinity and saying, "Look, we have to protect our land." In, in Native American culture, the land belongs to everybody. No such thing as a deed of, that you transfer from one family to the next one. Everybody owns the land. It's, the land is holy. The, Eretz, their Eretz Israel is the land wherever they're settling. And what the white man did is we, we and the, under the name of religion, we tried to take these savages and force them to become educated in our our, I mean, you know, Catholic culture. That was the dominant culture at that time, Catholic culture. So Rabbi Moshe, you, I mean, this is a question that we really can't answer so easily, but only history shows that we have suffered because we are Amsagula. We are the chosen people and we are chosen to inhabit the, the land. We are chosen to settle the land and anybody who holds us on the land becomes settlers of our land. Sad. I mean, oh the question of settler. Who's a settler and who does it belong to? I mean, the, that, that's the major issue with the, the, the territories. You know, the uh, Samaria, um, Judah and Samaria. I mean, this is a never-ending question of land. Land, oh, Richard, I, I like land how, is very important here. Right, and I like yeah. how you're, how you're um, fast-forwarding to modern day because it was just an issue... Um, you know, in America during the Manifest Destiny era, it was just an issue in the biblical era for the Jews in Israel. But you think about the, the tension of, you know, I think of our community, our community is comprised of many people who would identify as religious Zionists. And yes. the challenge, I think, is that many people, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know about, I, I'll say many, I'll say many. I don't know if like many means over 50%, under 50%, but a significant group of people who would agree with your sentiments, Richard, that Native Americans were mistreated, uh, that it wasn't right to just take away their culture and their land from them. But then at the same time, uh, how does one make sense of the land of Israel that we have today? And I think that really gets to the heart of the matter. For some people- Great point, great yeah. point. And, and I thought about that this morning, because oh, I had a flash. And uh, other people uh, the point, that, the the point that you make is, is great. That we have been forced into a very very small territory. That is the that is the way of the great one has ordained it, if you will, ordained it. Our manifest destiny is that we have this small holy land. It's holy to us. It was promised biblically to us. We have it. It's very tenuous. Very tenuous. We got to fight to hold on to it. We don't have a manifest destiny to hold on to this land. It can be taken away. Missiles can, from seven different enemy countries can rain on us, rain terror. We don't know at any point. We have to be constantly, vigilantly defending our small territory. Okay, Native Americans, 40 million of them living in America before the original Balboa came in the 1500s. Uh, to settle on the West Coast, Balboa, um, and, and there were 40 million uh, Native Americans. They were decimated in time to 300,000. I read, the, I couldn't believe the figure. They wow. uh, they had tremendous territories. The uh, the um, uh, the Apache Indians, the uh, the um, Native American Indians of the West, they had tremendous. And now what they have done. They are now have reservations. They have been constricted into very small territories. At one time, huge amounts of land to cultivate with sheep. Now, they no longer have that. Now they're forced to live on top of each other. The amount of COVID pandemic is highest among these Navajo tribes. The Navajo Nation is the largest parcel of reservation. It constitutes four states, tremendous parcel of land that the United States government bequeathed, bequeathed to the Native Americans. And they're living on top of each other. Their education is substandard. The sanitation substandard. Um, uh, their 
uh, utilities, the, uh, the internet substandard, they're living under really uh, poverty conditions. And, and that's what we have brought upon their nation, okay? We as, uh, as a nation, talk about Israel right now, very small, but we're very powerful. You know, we've utilized all of our experience and, and we're, we're, we're the great leaders in high tech, high tech nation, you've heard that term. Um, but we've suffered, we, we continue to suffer. Anti-Semitism is on the rise everywhere. Where we go as Jews, you gotta be very low key. That's what my parents taught me is that don't brag who you are, just do what you have to do. We're enlightened to nations. And I think that's part of the story here is that Leslie Marmon Soko is very proud of her traditions, very proud. And she shows how the, the father does not want to lose the goodwill of the Native Americans. He, he partakes in the right. He doesn't want to because they have not done the Christian sacrament according to his way. But he's willing to open up, you know, open up, uh, you know, let the fence down. And we, we do that too. Uh, you know, it's argued that's what the Talmud is all about. It's fences around fences around fences. But we, you know, we lower the, we lower the bar. You got to lower the bar in order to keep it going. In order to keep the the Native Americans within your fold, so to speak, because they are they they do observe they go to church on on Sunday, and they do some of the sacraments, but they don't do them all. And the question is, do they get salvation? I mean, that's a that's a big issue behind the Catholic Church in, in this particular story. Did the Father do right by part giving them the the one of the holy sacraments, but they didn't do the, the rest of it. They didn't do the Angelus. They didn't uh, sing out the right uh, tunes that are mentioned in the story and so forth. Um, just, uh, I just want to take there, a moment. There is one other. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just, did anyone have any questions or input that they wanted to share? I just wanted to take a second because I know we're, we're approaching 1245, so we're getting close to the end. So I don't want to like, you know, just have one minute left and then have everyone try to fit in their questions. I didn't get all that that uh, Richard was talking about. Um, uh, my connection to it, I read, I, I just, you know, uh, scanned the story. And, and my thinking was that it was more of a, a personal, a personal account of burying a man of, of, um, um, you know, um, Native American. This Native, Native American. American grandfather, the grandfather. And, yeah, yeah, and 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 marrying it with uh, making sure that that the the Christian or Catholic part of it was was observed as well, and that um, and that there wasn't real satisfaction until this until the priest sprinkled the holy water. Um, and as a matter of fact, but it never I, hits the body. Uh, sorry? Phyllis, it never hits the body because it, it was too cold. Uh, this takes place uh, during yeah. uh, the winter. Uh, yeah, but it never he hits did, the but body. He did, but he did. He did sprinkle, and not only that, but that he, he did. Yes, he did. He, he continued. Yeah. He sprinkled even more until the the, the flask was empty. So um, obviously, yeah. maybe there was some feeling of guilt that uh, they hadn't done it. And that they were ready to bury him without that, and and this idea that that um, he, he they wanted to make sure that he was given not only his Native American uh, rights but also um, sure. the, the the rights of the place where he was living the rest of his life right. in, in in America. Right. So right. I don't. I, you and, know. and I think, Phyllis, you. You, you, it's a natural segue for you to go into the idea of mixed marriages. And there are, there are rabbis that perform mixed marriages. They're very peripheral. I came across one that will, you know, uh, officiate uh, bar mitzvahs of mixed, of mixed marriages where the, uh, the, the woman is of Christian faith and, and the husband of, of Jewish faith and, and, and mix the traditions. Uh, how, how far are we prepared to open up the door to keep our tradition going? I mean, at what, what point do we just say, hey, we've got to get these people on the outside and let them feel what our tra 
what the what our native tradition is, our the orthodox way of doing, it, and let them be a part of it, even though they don't understand it. But maybe at some point they will. So maybe we should open the doors up occasionally and let people of mixed faith uh, partake in some way. I'm not saying uh, I, I agree with. I don't agree with. Uh, uh, what I just said with this particular rabbi, he calls himself a rabbi, he has an ordination, um, but he is willing to uh, go to the periphery and, and get people who are karov, not only the karov, but rachok, okay? That's what it says in Isaiah, I believe that it says that, you know, that those who are far away and those who are close, that we should all be a part of this, you know, the uncircumcised, the ones that are not in, in, into the swing of tradition should be given a chance to come back in some way, okay? Um, but to me, it's, it, it, it shows a clash of cultures. It's a clash, what you, you described to me. No, he, I don't he, think it's a clash. I don't think it's a clash at all. I think on the contrary. I think he it's, hesitated. A no. it's a marrying of- First of, of all, they, okay, I, I, finally, it's, it is a marriage, but it's, it's a very, Marriage of convenience, okay? It's a lukewarm no, marriage, okay? No, 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 I, I don't think so, because if you look at the last line, it clearly no. says it. It says that uh, now the old man could send them big thunderclouds for sure. In other yes. words, if he didn't yes. have the holy water, they would be thunderclouds from his Native American descent. Well, but now that, the, that, now that the holy water was added, now it's big thunderclouds. Big time, yeah, big time. I, I see your point. There is a point there. There is a, there's a tension. Maybe that's the word. There's a tension between the two cultures. Okay, and at some point, the 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 the, the, the father was very. He didn't want to do it. If you read the story very carefully, he did not want to do it at all. He was really adamant. And then something inside him said, look, uh, I, like you say, I, I feel guilty if I don't do it. They're, they do come to my shul on Sunday. They worship uh, in, my, in my temple, even though they have their own rights at home. Uh, and maybe I should just uh, keep it going. He didn't realize, he didn't understand what he did. He, he, he created the, the means for this uh, Native American soul to, to unite with the great spirit and to somehow open up the heavens to reign. I agree with you. But the father never understood that. His culture is separate from their culture. But somehow he decided to open up the window and, and, and sprinkle the water. He had no idea what he did. But you said it was a great blessing for them. And it ends on a good note. I agree. It ends on a good note. And, and maybe the theme of the story is that we need to be tolerant of the other. That there are other cultures. We live in other cultures. And how, how far do we go with this Torah Amada? How much, how much do we bring to, to the secular culture? And how much are we willing to particular to participate in secular culture? Okay. Some of us won't go to a, to a church, even if it's for a secular reason. Okay. I had my Columbia University, uh, my BA given to me at St. St. John the Divine Church because it was raining in the Columbia campus. And so we had to have the right, the rights of passage uh, to my higher degree uh, in, in a church. There are many Orthodox people that probably would have said, I, I'm not going to a church. I don't care what, what it is. It's you know, a vote Zora. Okay. So how, how much are we willing to bring our light as, as Jews into the St. John the Divine, okay? Uh, and and uh, a president dies, and, and, and Joe Lieberman, does he go to the, uh, the last rites of, uh, in a church uh, to pay respect to George Bush Sr.? These are questions that we, that we struggle with every day. You go to Rabbi Moshe, and he'll give you a modern orthodox take. That's why the rabbi is there, is to give you uh, the modern orthodox take. And those... Well, how about this one? When I grew up, we were not allowed to walk past the Catholic Church. Yes. We, uh, we had to cross the street right. and walk on the other side of the street. Right, right Gloria. Right. And then when my son was growing up and the nuns wore these long habits, we went 
passed a nun and Ethan in the loudest voice said, Mommy, look at the witch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, Listen, I, Phyllis, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis and uh, Gloria, you'd appreciate this. As a, as a young Ramaz, Ramaz student, 85th Street, 85th Street and Park Avenue, we walked across over to Madison. We walked uh, in front of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And we were told, hey, th those are the, they're the militant Catholics. They, they, they killed Jews uh, during the Middle Ages and during the uh, the Crusades, you know, and we would walk across the street, just like you mentioned, uh, and uh, and they would still call us Jews. I mean, I remember that very clearly. St. Ignatius of Loyola was down the street from Ramaz, and still is, you know. <laughs> wow. Well, okay, wow. Uh, and, uh, I think there's a lot of great conversations that could branch off over here. Questions of syncretism, tolerance, living together with other religions, um, how do we accommodate people who might be on the fringes without acquiescing uh, our value? Exactly. Um, there's so many, you know, questions about going to a funeral in a church of someone who has a different religion than you. There's really, it's not just a question of uh, philosophy, but there's really practical decisions that we might make based on this conversation. So, um, you know, uh, Richard, maybe, I, maybe you want to share your I just want to mention one of the stories that um, I lived in in California, for, as you know, for nearly 20 years. I lived uh, outside of Sacramento, and a group of us started a new shul. Uh, we weren't quite sure it was going to be conservative, conservative orthodox. And in order for us to have our first, uh, my daughter was uh, six months old, and it was Yom Kippur, and I, I chanted the Haftarah Yom Kippur. And we covered up a large... Uh, uh, depiction of, of the Pieta, that's the mother holding the little child Christ behind it. We had a big sheet covering it, and that's the only place that we could have our shul. And again, that was an accommodation that uh, the leader of our group, the young rabbi that that formed our group, and it's still alive, the, the group was formed 35 years ago in Sacramento, and the shul is still there, Citrus Heights. And that was a question that we had to decide. Uh, but we covered up. No one knew that there was a PA top behind us, except if you want to sneak behind, you could see it. But that's what you have to do in order to have your service together. You know? Wow. Okay, Richard, thank you so much for your time and expertise. And God willing, we're going to be in touch with a, uh, a new story. It'll go out in the bulletin. But we'll take, um, I think Phyllis suggested, that I'll try to make an email list because I know this is a, a little difficult because it's once a month. So you, it's hard to get into the routine. So I'll try to remind people about the class, but thanks for taking your, your lunchtime to join us. And thank you, Richard, for your expertise in literature. You. you always have My a pleasure. wealth of knowledge to share with us. And uh, I look forward to learning in about a month from now. So just Amen. thank you for those. And everybody now. should be well. And Gloria, thank you for coming. Appreciate your your comments as ever, you're always uh, right on point with uh, uh, extending our conversation. Thank you, Richard, them. and thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Phyllis. Everybody be well. well. Okay. Kak Sameach. 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 A good Chodesh.